Hello and welcome to Bar 10 Test Prep, where it's our goal to help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time every day. Lesson 9. Question number 1. Homer lived on the second floor of a small convenience store slash gas station that he owned. One night, he refused to sell Augie a six-pack of beer after hours, saying he could not violate the state laws. Augie became enraged and deliberately drove his car into one of the gasoline pumps, severing it from its base. There was an ensuing explosion, causing a ball of fire to go from the underground gasoline tanks into the building. As a result, the building burned to the ground and Homer was killed. In a common law jurisdiction, if Augie's charged with murder and arson, he should be A. Convicted of both offenses B. Convicted of involuntary manslaughter and acquitted of arson C. Convicted of arson and involuntary manslaughter Or D. Acquitted of both offenses Take 10 seconds to choose the best option. If you chose option A, convicted of both offenses, you were correct. Under the common law, murder is the intentional killing of a person with malice aforethought. Malice aforethought requires that the killing be committed with one of the following states of mind. One, intent to kill. Two, intent to commit great bodily injury. Three, wanton and willful disregard for human life. Or four, intent to commit a felony. Under the felony murder rule, a person can be found guilty of a killing that occurs during the commission of an underlying felony that is inherently dangerous, such as burglary, arson, rape, robbery, or kidnapping. The typical anagram I like to use there is bark. B for burglary, A for arson, R for rape, R for robbery, K for kidnapping, B-A-R-R-K, bark. The, the death must have been reasonable and foreseeable uh, result of the felony. Arson under common law requires the malicious intention or reckless dis disregard of an obvious or known risk. Burning of another's house, for example, would constitute that reckless disregard. In this case, Augie intentionally disregarded the obvious risk of causing an explosion when he drove his car into a gasoline pump. This resulted in the burning of the building, which served as Homer's dwelling, because Homer lived on the second floor. Therefore, Augie should be convicted of arson, given that this was his home. Since, Homer was, since Homer's kill, killing was during Augie's commission of the felony of arson, Augie can be convicted of murder under the felony murder rule, because Homer's death was reasonably foreseeable, as Augie had just left Homer inside the convenience store and obviously knew he was there. Alternatively, Augie can be found guilty of murder, even without the arson felony. Augie clearly acted with the wanton and willful disregard of human life by running his car into a gas station, which resulted in Homer's death. Therefore, Augie should be convicted of murder as well as arson. Let's move on to question number two. On December 15th, lawyer received from Stationer Inc., a retailer of office supplies, an offer consisting of its catalog and a signed letter. That letter stating, we will supply you with as many of the items in the enclosed catalog as you order during the next calendar year. We assure you that this offer and the prices of the catalog will remain firm throughout the coming year. For this question only, assume that no other correspondence passed between stationer and lawyer until the following April 15th, four months later. When stationer received from lawyer a faxed order of 100 reams of your paper, catalog item number 101, did lawyer's April 15th fax constitute an effective acceptance of stationer's offer at the prices specified in the catalog? Your options are A, yes, because stationer had not revoked its offer before April 15th. B, yes, because a one-year option contract had been created by stationer's offer. C, no, because under applicable law, the irre irrevocability of stationer's offer was limited to a period of three months. Or D, no, because a lawyer did not accept stationer's offer within a reasonable time. Take 10 seconds and choose the best option. If you chose A, yes, because stationer had not revoked its offer before April 15th, you'd be correct. Under the UCC, a firm offer is a written offer to buy or sell goods signed by a merchant. Promising it will be held open 
for a period of time. A UCC firm offer is irrevocable for the stated time or a reasonable time if no time period is stated. But in no case will the offer be irrevocable for longer than three months. A revocable offer can be revoked by the offerer any time before acceptance. In this case, Stationer Inc. is a merchant with respect to office supplies because it regularly deals with office supplies. The letter enclosed with the catalog qualified as a UCC firm offer because it was signed and stated the catalog prices would remain open for a specified period of time. However, because the UCC limits the irrevocability of a firm offer to three months, the offer became revocable by Stationer on March 15th. The issue then is whether lawyers' April 15th fax was an effective acceptance. Stationer had not revoked his offer because the question states no other correspondence had passed between the parties. Lawyer was thus able to accept the offer on April 15th because, like any offer, it could be accepted before the offerer revoked it. Therefore, lawyer's 15th facts constituted an effective acceptance of Stationer's offer at the prices specified in the catalog because Stationer had not revoked its offer of April 15th. Question number three. A federal statute appropriated $7 million for a nationwide essay contest on how the United States can best stop drug abuse. The statute indicates that its purpose is to generate new practical ideas for eliminating drug abuse in the United States. Contest rules set forth that the statute provided that winning essays are to be selected on the basis of the originality, aptness, and feasibility of their ideas. The statute expressly authorizes a first place of one million, fifty second prizes of a hundred thousand dollars each, and one hundred third prizes of ten thousand dollars each. It is also stated that judges for the contest are to be appointed by the President of the United States with the advice and consent of the Senate, and that all residents of the United States who are not employees of the federal government are eligible to enter and win this contest. A provision of the statute authorizes any taxpayer of the United States to challenge its constitutionality. In a suit by a federal taxpayer, a challenge to the constitutionality of the statute, the court should a refuse to decide its merits because the suit involves policy questions that are inherently political and therefore non-justiciable. b. Hold the statute unconstitutional because it does not provide sufficient guidelines for awarding the prize money appropriated by Congress and therefore unconstitutionally delegates legislative powers to the contest judges. c. Hold the statute unconstitutional because its relationship to the legitimate purposes of the spending power of the Congress is too tenuous and conjectural to satisfy the necessary and proper clause of Article 1. Or D. Hold the statute constitutional because it's reasonably related to general welfare. It states concrete objectives and it provides adequate criteria for conducting the essay contest and awarding the prize money. Take 10 seconds and choose what you believe to be the best answer. If you chose D, hold the statute constitutional because it reasonably related to general welfare. It states concrete objectives and it provides adequate criteria for conducting the essay contest and awarding the prize money. You were correct. Under the spending clause, Congress may spend to provide for the common defense and general welfare. Furthermore, no limit exists on Congress's ability to delegate legislative powers as long as intelligible standards are set and the power is not uniquely confined to the Congress. In this case, the statute is a valid exercise of Congress's spending power because it is clearly provided for the general welfare, i.e. the elimination of drug abuse within the United States. Furthermore, Congress's delegation of this legislative power is also valid because it set forth intelligible standards of how to apportion the prize money, and the power is not uniquely confined to Congress. For example, the power to declare or impeach war, Let's move on to question number four. Defendant is on trial for robbing a bank in State A. She testified that she was in State B at the time of the robbery. Defendant calls her friend, witness, to testify that two days before the robbery, defendant told him that she was going to spend the next three days in State B. Witness's testimony is A. Admissible because the statement falls within the present sentence impression exception to the hearsay rule. B. Admissible 
because a statement of plans falls within the hearsay exception for then existing state of mind. C. Inadmissible because it is offered to establish an alibi by defendant's own statement. Or D. Inadmissible because it is hearsay not within any exception. Take 10 seconds and please choose the best answer. If you chose option B, you'd be correct. Admissible because a statement of plans falls within the hearsay exception for then existing state of mind. Hearsay is an out-of-court statement being offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted in that statement. Hearsay is generally inadmissible. One hearsay exception is the present state of mind exception, i.e. a hearsay statement of the declarant's uh, then existing physical or mental condition or state of mind is going to admit it's going to be admissible to show that condition or state of mind, such as here, the statement that the individual would be leaving the state. Intention is a state of mind. If the statement is admissible to prove the declarant's intention, the jury can further infer action following the intention. Here, defendant's statement to witness two days before the robbery shows defendant's intention to be in state B for the next three days. Intention is a state of mind. So defendant's statement is admissible as a present state of mind hearsay exception. The jury can further infer that defendant spend the next three days in state B so she could not have robbed state A. Therefore, witness's testimony is admissible because a statement of plans falls within the hearsay exception for then existing state of mind. Let's move on to question number five. Arthur's estate plan included a revocable trust established 35 years ago with ABC Bank as trustee. The principal asset of the trust has always been Blackacre, a very profitable, debt-free office building. The trust instrument instructs the trustee to pay the net income to Arthur for life, and after the death of Arthur, to pay the net income to his wife, Alice, for life, and after her death, to distribute the net trust estate as she may appoint by will, or in default of her exercise of this power of appointment, to my son, her stepson, Charles. Arthur died 30 years ago, survived by Alice and Charles. Arthur had not revoked or amended the trust agreement. A few years after Arthur's death, Alice remarried. She then had a child, Marie. She was subsequently widowed for a second time and last year died. Her will contained only one dispositive provision. I give my entire estate to my daughter, Marie, and I intentionally make no provision for my stepson, Charles. Marie is now 22 years old. The common law rule against perpetuities is unmodified by statute in the jurisdiction. There are no other applicable statutes. Charles brought an appropriate action against Marie to determine who was entitled to the net trust estate and thus to Blackacre. If the court rules for Marie, it will be because A. Alice's life estate and general power of appointment merge into the complete ownership in Alice. B. The rule against perpetuities does not apply to general powers of appointment. C. The jurisdiction deems entire estate to be a reference to Blackacre or to Alice's general power of appointment. Or D. Alice intended that Charles should not benefit by reason of her death. Take 10 seconds and tell me what your best option is. If you chose option C, you'd be correct. The jurisdiction deems entire estate to be a reference to Blackacre or to Alice's general power of appointment. There's nothing wrong with the trust instrument instructions. So Alice had the right to distribute the net trust estates as she may appoint by will. The only issue is that Alice's will only had one provision. I give my entire estate to my daughter, Marie. Since Arthur's net trust estate is not technically part of Alice's estate, for the court to rule in favor of Marie in this case, it would have to consider entire estate to be a reference to Blackacre or to Alice's general power of appointment. This is a great example of the power of processes of elimination on the MBE, because even if you can't see that C is the correct answer right away, the other three answer choices are clearly incorrect. Question number six. Company designed and built a processing plant for the manufacture of an explosive chemical. Engineer was retained by company to design a filter system for the processing plant. 
She prepared an application for a permit to build the plant's filter system and submitted it to the state's Department of Environmental Protection. As required by DEP regulations, engineers submitted a blueprint to the DEP with the application for a permit. The blueprint showed the entire facility and was signed and sealed by her as a licensed professional engineer. After the project was completed, a portion of the processing plant exploded, injuring plaintiff. During discovery and an action by plaintiff against engineer, it was established that the explosion was caused by a design defect in the processing plant that was unrelated to the filter system designed by engineer. In that action, will plaintiff, will plaintiff prevail? A. Yes, if engineer signed, sealed, and submitted a blueprint that showed the design defect. B. Yes, because all of the, pla- all of the plant's designers are jointly and severally liable for the defect. C. No, because engineer owed no duty to plaintiff to prevent the particular risk of harm. Or D. No, if engineer was an independent contractor. Take 10 seconds and see what you believe is the best option. If you chose option C, no, because engineer owed no duty to plaintiff to prevent the particular risk of harm, you'd be correct. The duty of care requires that a person act accordingly to a certain standard to protect others against an unreasonable risk of injury. Engineer was hired to design a filter system for the processing plant. The engineer designed a filter system that was free of any defects. Since the injury to plaintiff was established to have been caused by a design defect in the processing plant that was unrelated to the filter system, the engineer owed no duty of care to this particular plaintiff and this particular injury. Question number seven. At a party, Diane and Victor agreed to play a game they called Spin the Barrel. Victor took an unloaded revolver, placed one bullet in the barrel, and spun the barrel. Victor then pointed the gun at Diane's head and pulled the trigger once. The gun did not fire. Diane then took the gun, pointed it at Victor, spun the barrel, and pulled the trigger once. The gun fired, and Victor fell over dead. A statute in the jurisdiction defines murder in the first degree as an intentional and premeditated killing or one occurring during the commission of a common law felony. And a murder in the second degree is defined as all other murder at common law. Manslaughter is defined as a killing in the heat of passion upon an adequate legal provocation or a killing caused by gross negligence. The most serious crime for which Diane can't properly be convicted is A. Murder in the first degree because the killing was intentional and premeditated and in any event occurred during the commission of a felony of assault with a deadly weapon. B. Murder in the second degree, because Diane's act posed a great threat of serious bodily harm. C. Manslaughter, because Diane's act was grossly negligent and reckless. D. No crime, because Victor and Diane voluntarily agreed to play a game and each other assumed the risk of death. Take 10 seconds and choose the best option. If you chose option B, murder in the second degree, because Diane's act posed a great threat of serious bodily harm, you'd be correct. At common law, second degree murder is the intentional killing of another person with malice aforethought. Malice aforethought requires one of the following states of mind or mens rea. One, intent to kill. Two, intent to commit bodily injury. Three, depraved heart killing or wanton disregard. Or four, intent to commit a felony. In this case, Diane pointed a loaded gun at Victor and pulled the trigger. This action would clearly satisfy the requirement of a subjective awareness of an unjustified high risk to human life. As such, the most serious crime for which Diane can properly be convicted is second degree murder. Question number eight. Let's revisit an old question, an old fact pattern. On December 15th, lawyer received from Stationer Inc., a retailer of office supplies, an offer consisting of its catalog and a signed letter stating, we will supply you with as many of the items in the enclosed catalog as you order during the next calendar year. We assure you that this offer and the prices in the catalog will remain firm throughout the coming year. For this question only, assume that on January 15th, having at the time received no reply from lawyer, stationer notified lawyer that effective February 1st, it was increasing its prices of certain specified items in its catalog. 
Is the price increase effective with respect to catalog orders stationer receives from lawyer during the month of February? A. No, because stationer's original offer, including the price, price term, became irrevocable under the doctrine of promissory estoppel. B. No, because stationer is a merchant with respect to office supplies and its original offer, including the price term, was irrevocable through the month of February. C. Yes, because stationer received no consideration to support its assurance that it would not increase prices. Or D. Yes, because the period for which stationer gave assurances that it would not raise prices was longer than three months. Take 10 seconds and choose the best option. If you chose B, you'd be correct. No, because stationer is a merchant with respect to office supplies, and the original offer, including the price term, was irrevocable through the month of February. The rule regarding UCC firm offers is as follows. A written offer of goods signed by merchant promising it will, held, it will be held open is irrevocable for the stated time or reasonable time if no time period is stated, but in no case will the offer be irrevocable for longer than three months. In this case... Stationer Inc.'s firm offer was for one year, but because of the three-month maximum, Stationer would still be able to revoke this offer after three months. However, since the offer is irrevocable for three months, the price increase is, in fact, ineffective. Let's move on to question number nine. Kelly County in the state of Green is located adjacent to the borders of the state of Red. The communities located in Kelly County are principally suburbs of Scarletville, a large city located in Red and therefore there's a large volume of traffic between that city and Kelly County. While most of that traffic is by private passenger automobiles, some of it is by taxi cabs and other types of commercial vehicles. In ordinance of Kelly County, the stated purpose of which is to reduce traffic congestion, provides that only taxi cabs registered in Kelly County may pick up or discharge passengers in that county. The ordinance also provides that only residents of Kelly County may register taxi cabs in that county. Which of the following is the proper result in a suit brought by Scarletville taxi cab owners challenging the constitutionality of this Kelly County ordinance? A. Judgment for Scarletville taxi cab owners because the fact that private passenger automobiles contribute more of the traffic congestion problem in Kelly County than do taxi cabs indicates that the ordinance is not a reasonable means by which to solve that problem. B. Judgment for Scarletville taxi owners because the ordinance unduly burdens interstate commerce by insulating Kelly County taxi owners from out-of-state competition without adequate justification. C. Judgment for Kelly County because the ordinance forbids taxi cabs registered in other counties of Green as well as in states other than Green to operate in Kelly County and therefore it does not discriminate against interstate commerce. D. Judgment for Kelly County, because Scarletville taxi owners do not constitute a suspect class and the ordinance is reasonably related to the legitimate governmental purpose for reducing traffic congestion. Take 10 seconds and choose the best option. The correct answer is B, judgment for Scarletville taxi cab owners because the ordinance unduly burdens interstate commerce by insulating Kelly County taxi cab owners from out-of-state competition without adequate justification. If Congress has not acted, a state or local government may regulate local aspects of interstate commerce unless the state local laws discriminate against out-of-staters or place an undue burden on interstate commerce. In this case, the statute does not discriminate against out-of-staters, i.e. taxicab drivers from Scarletville in the state of Red, because the same rules apply to in-staters, i.e. taxicab drivers from the state of Green, not located in Kelly County. However, even if the statute is not discriminatory, the law will nevertheless violate the Dormant Commerce Clause if the statute places an undue burden on interstate commerce. Here, the statute does place an undue burden on interstate commerce because the justification for the statute is to reduce traffic congestion. But private passenger automobiles, as opposed to taxi cabs, cause most of the traffic and this congestion. As such, the burdens would outweigh the benefits and the law should be struck down as unconstitutional. 
And our final question for this grouping, question number 10. Paula sued Donna for breach of contract. Paula's position was that Joan, whom he understood to be Donna's agent, said, on behalf of Donna, I accept your offer. Donna asserted that Joan had no actual or apparent authority to accept the offer on Donna's behalf. Paul's testimony concerning Joan's statement is A. Admissible, provided the court finds, first, by a preponderance of the evidence, that Joan had actual or apparent authority to act for Donna. B. Admissible, upon or subject to introduction of evidence sufficient to support a finding by the jury that Joan had actual or apparent authority to act for Donna. C. Inadmissible, if Joan does not testify and her absence is not excused. Or D, inadmissible, because it is hearsay, not within any exception. Take 10 seconds and choose the best option. If you chose B, admissible upon or subject to introduction of evidence sufficient to support a finding by the jury that Joan had actual or apparent authority to act for Donna, you'd be correct. The rule under the vicarious party admissions exception to hearsay is that a statement made by an agent that concerns a matter within the scope of the relationship and made during the principal agent relationship is admissible because it is not considered hearsay under the federal rules of evidence. It is, in in fact, an exemption. This testimony would be admissible as a vicarious party admission, assuming, of course, that Joan was actually Donna's agent. The evidence required prior to the introduction of Joan's statement would be evidence sufficient to support a finding by the jury that Joan had actual or apparent authority to act for Donna, i.e. that Joan was in fact Donna's agent. Thank you for joining us on Bar 10 Test Prep, where we help you prepare for the bar exam 10 questions at a time. Please like, subscribe, and click the notifications bell so that you can be updated every time we upload new content.